This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 844, recorded on December 17, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent, and everybody else. Um, let's see, how would I describe today? Uh, midsummer. <laughs> I'm I'm freaked out by the um, near record breaking temperatures that we've been approaching in December. This is uh, two degrees short of the, world, the record for New York. It's sixty degrees out there right now, I think, and it's uh, sixty two is the record set in two thousand and one. So. I don't know what's going on, but I, I think I do, but I'd rather not use that as the subject for today's twin. <laughs> 14 Celsius and, and sunny here in Midtown. Also yeah. joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Yes, it is a lovely day. Um, it, it's a chilly 57 Fahrenheit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a, a very lovely day, but not what I would expect for December. Right. Uh, also joining us today, our guest coming back for a second time from Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania and the University of Pennsylvania, Paul Offed. Welcome back. Thank you. I'm actually right now in Avalon, New Jersey, where it is 14 degrees uh, oh, Celsius wow. and wow. partly cloudy. That must be across from Philadelphia, right, in that area? About an hour, an hour and a half away, yeah, oh, okay. near the shore, although not too many people on the shore right now. Must be because of <laughs> Indeed, indeed. Well, I'm. I really thought that this whole thing would be resolved by now, but it's not. We're far from it. Uh -huh. So, hence, we need you back to uh, help us out. And and yet, I want to talk as we discussed about children uh, and vaccines and boosters. And to to start it off, yesterday uh, you you emailed me about the ACIP meeting. And you, you said you thought they would make a recommendation for mRNA over J&J, &J, and, and they did. So maybe you could explain that to us start, to start off. Sure. So the J&J &J vaccine, which is a um, vectored virus vaccine using human adenovirus 26, um, to, which then contains the gene that codes for the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, um, is, is a very good vaccine. I, mean, I think it was always a two-dose vaccine. It launched at the, the end of February of this year as a single-dose vaccine. But when that happened, they were in the midst of a two-dose trial, a 30,000-person two-dose phase three trial. So I think that was always what was going to happen, where it was then found to be equally effective against prevention of really all symptomatic infection, around 94% prote protection. Um, hmm. And so, so that's where we were. What, what happened was a few months ago, th there were reports of um, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, so a blood clot in the brain, in um, a handful of patients, including one death. And with that, they paused the vaccine. This was months ago. Um, because they, but, but when it came, because they wanted to shake the tree, see if there were any other cases out there that they hadn't heard of. And when there really weren't, they came back and said, okay, here's this serious side effect. And in one case, fatal side effect, um, you need to be aware of that to be fully informed before you choose to make this vaccine, to choose this vaccine for yourself. Now what's happened is um, uh, yesterday, the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practice met to review another 54 cases of this, these oh, cerebral right. venous sinus thrombosis associated with eight deaths. And, and initially when they um, looked at this, the risk was roughly one per 500,000. So rare, but real. Now, at least for the 30 to 50 year old, it was more like one per 100,000. And also in the initially when they looked at it, this was primarily a disease, really solar disease of women and younger women. Now it's really all ages, 18 to 80, women and men, although primarily women, still women and men. So they couldn't really make a gender specific recommendation. Or they couldn't make an age specific recommendation. They had to either decide whether they wanted to have a preference or just leave it where it was, which is let people know that this is happening. But because we have an, another vaccine that's available that doesn't have a fatal side effect, um, they decided to say to make a preferential recommendation. So we'll see how this plays out. I mean, the last time that happened was with the shingles vaccine. I mean, Zostavax um, was on the market and then Shingrix came along, which was, although a two-dose vaccine is compared to the one-dose vaccine of Zostavax was clearly more effective, clearly in all age groups more effective. And so they made a preferential recommendation, which ultimately really killed uh, Merck's Zostavax product from the market. Um, we'll so, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, these additional 54 cases um, were these uh, cases that were just seen in kind of post-vaccine administration monitoring, or was there any particular study data on this? Yeah, it was seen in post post uh, post vaccine administration monitoring, and primarily the vaccine safety data link. I mean, that that's the the um, it, it, there's the vaccine adverse events reporting system, which really should be called the suspected vaccine adverse events reporting system, is at best sort of a hypothesis generating mechanism. So there were reports there, but the only real way to see whether or not this is a true vaccine effect is you need to look at at control groups. With that, you could see that this was rare but real, and, and it's also. You know, a phenomenon of the, um, you know, the AstraZeneca vaccine as well. And you, you wor- what you worry about is, and uh, Penny Heaton, actually, who represented Johnson & Johnson in yesterday's talk and is excellent. She used to sort of did work on the rotavirus vaccine way back when. Yeah. Um, you, what you worry about is that there, there are certain advantages to J&J's vaccine in terms of shipping and storage characteristics. And so w- in, the, in the developing world, um, they, they, that product is used primarily in some countries. And so you worry that this will uh, cast a negative light on vaccines. And worse, we're even more that it'll cast a negative light sort of on all vaccines that people will say, okay, you know, I don't even want the mRNA vaccines because here's this side effect that they didn't really tell us about till now. Well, to be clear, it has only been a single death, even though there've been other cases of this. Is that correct? Well, initially there was a single death. It's, with the data yesterday, it was 54 more cases and eight deaths. So oh, eight, eight. All right. That's different. Is, is uh, J&J also used overseas, Paul? Yes. No, it's in many other countries. And do we know about uh, this side effect there? I don't. I, I, I don't. I actually talked to Penny Heaton this morning um, about mm. this. Um, is there a way to intervene early if you know that they're about to go into a, mor- a morbidity, mortality situation? It's hard. I mean, I think what's interesting mm. about this is that it's clearly a class phenomenon. I mean, it does also happen with the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, and both are adenovirus vectors. Oh, okay. okay. You know, adeno, this, this is uh, AD26. Ad um, and, you know, there are other vaccines that are being made, RSV vaccines, for example, in development, that also use adenovirus vectors. The Ebola vaccine has an adenovirus vector. So um, mm. how will this play out in the future? The other thing you wonder about a little bit is, is, is this a phenomenon in any way associated with adenovirus infection? But right. But, but, you know, it's when, you, when you're infected with adenovirus, you know, you're, you're infected with a certain amount of virus and then it reproduces itself over and over again. Here you're given really, it's, this is, these are non-replicating viruses, but you're giving like 50 billion virus particles, which is <laughs> what you have during natural infection. Is there any data to suggest that the people who suffered most from this had a prior adenovirus infection? Not that I know, but also the, and, and remember the, the ad 26 is a rare serotype. So most people wouldn't okay. have been infected with that serotype, but most people are infected with that adenovirus. Right. Well, it also happens with uh, Chadox, right? The chimpanzee adenovirus. So, yeah. so uh, there are some people who can't take mRNA vaccines, I think because of uh, allergies to PEG. So what would happen to them? Good. Well, good question. I remember it's, it's not, it's a preferential recommendation. I, so if you've I, had a severe allergic reaction, for example, to a, to a dose of mRNA vaccine, which is a contraindication to getting a second dose, this would be the way to go. Remember, it's still yeah. one in 100,000. I mean, it's it, right. in that certain age group and primarily for women. So there are, it, it, it's still, and rem- so, so it's still, I think, the safer and better choice. And also remember the, the, the virus too. I mean, COVID is also associated with cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. To, to a couple to two to three times greater than you would expect actually from the vaccine. So without the vaccine of those same age group, what is the um, predicted mortality rate should they contract COVID-19? Right. Um, that's a good question. I'd, I'd have to sort of look back at the numbers. I mean, the... Um, but it's have, not eight. It's more than eight. Yeah, no, I would imagine it's more than eight. Yes. Uh, yes. So the risk of getting it is worse than the risk of being vaccinated against it. Often true with vaccine side effects. Yep. Yep. It's interesting. You know, we we did a paper last week, which showed that PF4 platelet factor four binds to the adenovirus capsid in a very specific place, and that may mediate these uh, clotting events. So, factor four. Yeah, pl- PF4. And I wonder. You just said that you see clotting, uh, cerebral clotting in in COVID. So it must be an entirely different mechanism. Right. Yeah. Um, Right, and what is that mechanism? It seems that there's that this virus has the unique capacity to cause vasculitis. Yeah, um, yeah. All right, it'd be interesting to see how that plays out with J and J, as you say, 
I didn't know about the uh, the shingles vaccine <laughs> uh, story, so that's not a that's not a good sign. Um, let's let's talk about uh, children and COVID. You wrote a lovely piece a few weeks ago in Science about why we have to immunize children. So present the case for us. So many people tell us that we shouldn't be immunizing kids. So tell us why we should be. Right, so Jeff Gerber and I wrote that piece in science. The, the, um, so, so, so what do we know? I mean, you, you never know everything. So the question is, when do you know enough? When, when we considered this um, at the end of October, October 26th, I think, and then the, the CDC then launched this on November the 2nd. Um, what, and I can tell you, in the two or three days before we met, I got 3,100 emails from people telling me, in <laughs> no uncertain terms, to vote no on that recommendation. <laughs> Subtle pressure wow. from vaccine activists. But the, the, um, so what, what did you know? I mean, you, you know that, um, that roughly at that point, by the end of October, there had been roughly 8,300 hospitalizations in children 5 to 11 years of age. So you knew that. You knew that of those who were hospitalized, a third went to the intensive care unit. You also knew that about a third of those who were hospitalized didn't have any definable comorbidities that would have put them at higher risk for severe disease. You knew that roughly 100 children had died of that, which, which then makes sort of the number of deaths and hospitalizations similar to, to what you would see, for example, for flu or chickenpox or other viruses for which you also have vaccines. Um, you knew that there was a 20, um, roughly 2,400 child trial, two to one vaccine to placebo. So 1,600 children got um, vaccine, 800 got placebo. You knew that there were 16 cases of COVID um, in the placebo group, three in the vaccine group for a, an efficacy of roughly 91%. So that's what you knew. But, you know, it, the, the emails that I got associated with, with when we did say yes was, really, that's it? 2,400 children? That's enough for you? No, knowing that <laughs> Pfizer did, it did a 40,000 child or person trial for those over yeah. 60 age yeah, before right. you did that one. And now you're only going to do 2,400 children for a population of 28 million children between 5 and 11 years of age. Is that enough? And, and so that's always the question. I mean, when do you know enough? So you could say, OK, we're, we won't do 2,400. We'll do 24,000. And so there won't be 16 cases of COVID in the placebo group. There'll be 160 cases. Wait, COVID. I want to interrupt you. Are you sure 24,000 is enough, Paul? <laughs> 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 what, what, what You'll get it no matter what number you mention, I think. I mean, what human price do you want to pay for knowledge? Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly, exactly. It's the, the polio story. I mean, and Vincent knows this better than me, but the, sure. I mean, the polio, you know, Jonas Salk didn't want to do that trial. He did not want to do that, that right, trial sure. where right. 420,000 children got vaccine and 200,000 got placebo. He did not want to give placebo yeah. to children, first and second graders in the 1950s, knowing that every year as many as 30,000 could be paralyzed and 1,500 died. He didn't right. want to do that. And so, so you did the trial and you found it was effective and you knew it was effective because there were 16 cases of, of 16 deaths in that trial, all in the placebo group. There were 36 cases of paralysis, 34 in the placebo group. I mean, you wow. never hear that part of the story. That's how you knew it was effective. And I think um, you never reckon, those were first and second graders in the 1950s. I was a first and second grader in the 1950s. I mean, those children could have lived long, healthy, fruitful lives, but for the flip of a coin. Yes. So one of the things you point out in your article is that the number of cases in children has been steadily uh, increasing since the beginning. Now, why is that? Um, yeah, so when the virus first rolled into this country, SARS-CoV-2 first came into the country, children accounted for a little less than 3% of cases. Now it's about 27%, I think because they are a susceptible group. I mean, as the virus gets more and more uh, transmissible, it seeks out those who are susceptible. And children are a susceptible group. I mean, if you, if you go down in ages, sort of look over 65, we're really good about vaccinating, sort of 85, 90%. As you do 10-year increments lower and lower, it's lower at each 10-year increment. So that when you get to the 12 to 15-year-old, you have 45%. Now, this vaccine's available for the 5 to 11-year-old. About 10 to 15% of, of children have gotten that vaccine. I mean, I was, I was on service a week and a half ago at Children's Hospital Philadelphia for a week. We admitted more children on, on, onto our service or onto the, into the hospital with COVID than I have seen before. I mean, it was uh, many children. So it, was, it was about 18 children we admitted that week, uh, many to the ICU. Um, most were over five. Uh, all but one really was over five. Many were over 12. And what all those children shared in common, and, and a handful were in the ICU, what many of those children shared in common is none of them were vaccinated. None of their parents were right. vaccinated. 
none of their siblings were vaccinated. I mean, we talked right. about booster dosing. It's like we need to just give dosing is what we need, not booster dosing. Were they, were they all Delta strain or were there some Omicron strain yeah, also? No, no, I would assume that. I mean, the Omicron's about a little less than 3% of cases. Yeah. Yep. Now, so I would imagine. So, Paul, how many um, uh, children have, in that age group now have been vaccinated in the U.S.? So, in the in the five to eleven yeah. year old age group, um, about so it's about ten percent, so maybe three million, mm-hmm. three of the twenty eight, three million of the twenty eight million. And these are with mRNA vaccines, correct? Yes, that's right. The J and J vaccine is not not uh, licensed for that. Or, uh, or and, and that group. Have we seen any myocarditis? No, interestingly, yeah. So that was actually just presented yesterday at uh, the ACIP meeting. I don't think there's been myocarditis in the five to eleven year old. And there, 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 I imagine there will be because sure. you would think that there would be some. And and the kids who come into the hospital, do, do any of them end up with long COVID? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we see long COVID. Yep. So you mentioned um, that you only saw one uh, child in the hospital who was under five. Um, and so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what's going on with the under five age group. I know that there were there was a report out today uh, about Pfizer's um, trial in the under five age group. Uh, and so what kind of things do we know about both severity and potential for vaccines in the, that age group? Right. So, so Pfizer has a 30 microgram dose for those over 12 as a two dose vaccine. They have a 10 microgram dose for two doses uh, for the five to 11 year old. For the, the less than five year old, six month to five year old, my understanding was a three microgram dose, um, and there was a two doses given roughly a month apart. And they, apparently the results were very disappointing. So what they've decided to do now is to give a third dose two months later and then see what they find and then submit. Because I think their initial plan was to try and submit the end of December for a January review for the, by the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee. But now, obviously, that's on hold. So, again, many people would say... Why do we have to immunize kids less than five? So, <laughs> what? Well, because they, they, they do suffer. I mean, we, 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 I mean, I saw a seven month old who was on a ventilator yeah. um, when I was on service. So, I mean, if you can prevent that and prevent it safely, then prevent it. Yeah, I think, I think this, th- this point doesn't sink in enough that even if there were one death, it's still to that kid's parents, it's important, right? It may not be important to you. It's That's hard. I wish I could have filmed everything I saw that week while I was on service and, and just shown that on television and say, here, here's pair of parents crying as they're taking their child up to the ICU to be sedated, have a tube put down into their trachea and put on a ventilator. And this was hard enough before it was preventable. I mean, now it's preventable. It makes it all the more heartbreaking. Do, do you think they could change the dose in that age group um, since you said it was a lower lower dose? Yeah, you'd think that would have been worked out in, in the phase one trials. I mean, you know, where you do dose ranging trials and dose interval trials to see what at least you think is going to be the kind of level of neutralizing antibodies that at least, you know, is seen after natural infection or that it is most likely to correlate with protection. But I got this was an unpleasant surprise. So the, as far as we can tell right now, the 11 and, and younger, they're going to be getting mRNA vaccines in the U.S., right, for the foreseeable future, right? That's right. Everybody, well, currently everybody's uh, less than seven, 17 and less gets mRNA, mRNA vaccines. vaccines. Okay. Vaccine. Yeah, and given the, the J&J news, there's probably not going to be any uh, incentive to expand J&J to those ages, right? Right. No, I, I'd be curious to hear what happens with J&J. It sort of reminds me of uh, the Road to Shield story. <laughs> I remember from the late 1990s when that was a vaccine that was on the market for about 10 months in this country and then was found to be a, so prevent rotavirus to cause a fever, vomiting, diarrhea in young children, which accounted for maybe 20 to 60 deaths in this country every year, about 75,000 hospitalizations. But when that vaccine came out, it was found to be a very rare cause of intussusception, which is just an intestinal blockage where the intestine kind of telescopes into itself and gets stuck, which can be serious. Um, and it was between one in 10,000, one in 30,000 attributable risk. But that got it taken off the market. And, and here's a virus, rotavirus, which kills roughly 5,000 babies a year. I mean, it, it, I'm sorry, 500,000 babies a year. I mean, as many as 2,000 babies a day. It's, it's really the biggest killer of, of infants and young children. Um, and so 
it was taken off the market here. And, and four months later, uh, the, the, uh, it went to the World Health Organization because the makers of Rotashield at the time, Wyeth, didn't want it to be lost in the developing world where the benefit and risk ratio was obviously dramatically different. And I was at that meeting. It was in Geneva, February 2000. And, you know, Wyeth was great. We'll give you the technology. We're in no sense interested in protecting it. We're going to give you the cells in which it's grown, which wasn't all that easy. It was sort of fetal rhesus lung cells. We'll tell you how to do this. We'll help you build the buildings because they just didn't want to bury the technology. And country after country stood up and said, if it's not safe for America's children, it's not safe for our children, wow. even though the risk oh, benefit. And it was some time before replacements were developed, right? Well, seven years. I mean, our, our, they wrote it. Uh, tech vaccine, which you know came out of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, was uh, came in 2006. So seven years, but seven years. Think about that with 500,000 deaths yeah, a day, yeah. people, which could have been prevented. Well, Harry Greenberg tells me to this day he wasn't sure that there was a risk of intussusception. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was. It, I, I know Harry well. I was, I was in his lab for a couple of years. Um, it was. It was. Uh, it was rare, but it was definitely real. I mean, I yeah. think the the uh, the vaccine safety data link trials. Yeah. Were pretty okay. Good on that. All right. Let's let's talk about boosters. Um, so I think about six months ago, I wrote a blog post reviewing why I thought that the evidence uh, wasn't there supporting a booster and and you wrote to me and you and you said you agreed and so it's been 6 months so now where, where what's the story where do you stand on booster doses third doses of vaccines yeah i think i'm i'm becoming more and more alone in this but here's the way i stand <laughs> <laughs> um we have to define what the goal of this vaccine is okay. if the goal of this vaccine is what I think it should be, which is protection against serious illness, um, meaning right. the kind of illness that causes you to go to the doctor's office or go to the hospital or go to the ICU. Right. To date, uh, two doses of an mRNA-containing vaccine against all three variants, you know, D614G, Alpha, Delta, has held up to the present time. Everything the CDC has presented or published has shown that hospitalization, the graph looks just straight. I mean, you're sort of in the 80 to low 90 percent range for protection against hospitalization. So the, the, the reason that has been offered for, for, uh, by Dr. Fauci in part is that, that that's not going to be true for Omicron, that, that with Omicron, you're, you're not going to get that kind of protection. Now, if you argue, as you have many times on the show, that protection against serious illness is mediated primarily by immunological memory cells, and especially memory T cells, those regions are going to be more conserved on Omicron then you would expect the protection against serious illness would still hold up with two doses. And, and all the, you don't have really any data in this country yet, but we will. And, and you do have some data out of South Africa that showed that protection was about 70% against serious illness. So if that's the goal, I would argue two doses meet that goal. Um, but if, if the goal is not that, if the goal is preventing any symptomatic illness, which is a very high bar for this kind of virus, meaning a mucosal virus that doesn't have viremia as part of pathogenesis, I mean, you know, I mean, like rotavirus or flu or the bacteria like pertussis, that is a very high bar. I mean, I can tell you that working on rotavirus for 25 years, our vaccine, natural infection protects against moderate to severe disease, but it doesn't do that good of a job protecting against asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic infection, which is also true of the vaccine. The, the, where, where we got hung up, I think, I think there were two um, misconceptions that were that happened over the last year. The first was the phase three trials. Uh, those phase three trials that we we looked at December were almost at, at exactly the one year. Yeah, so it's December tenth. Um, today is December seventeenth. But on December tenth, our FDA vaccine advisory committee reviewed Pfizer's forty thousand person trial. A, a week later, on December seventeenth, we reviewed Moderna's thirty thousand person trial. Those were typical of any pediatric or adult vaccine trial. What wasn't typical was the efficacy follow up. Those were essentially three month studies. I mean, those participants had just recently received their second dose. So when you when you saw protection against mildly symptomatic illness of 95 percent, there's no way that was going to hold up, uh, because if you believe that neutralizing antibodies do correlate with sort of protection against mild or asymptomatic illness, the neutralizing antibodies fade. And, and so that had to come down. What happened was I think the second Mistake. And so we should have been aware of that because we kept using the term fading immunity with regard to protection against mild illness, which had to happen. The biggest mistake, I think, communications-wise we made was July 4th. That was the Provincetown outbreak, right? Thousands of men get together to celebrate July 4th in Provincetown, Massachusetts. 79% are vaccinated. Um, 346 of those vaccinated men got COVID. 
four were hospitalized. So that's a hospitalization rate of 1.2%. Great. That's a a vaccine that's working well. The other 342 had mild or asymptomatic illness that were called Mm. breakthroughs. Breakthrough. I mean, come on. That's a win. You know, the the hospitalized patients, those were breakthroughs. But the others were, that's what you want. You want this vaccine to keep you out of the hospital and keep you out of the hospital and keep you out of the morgue. And it was doing that. And instead, we called it a breakthrough. Brett Kavanaugh had, you know, had a breakthrough on this, which was asymptomatic. You know, Lindsey Graham, I'm not to keep talking about Republicans, but <laughs> Lindsey Graham, said, you know, he said, you know, um, he, he fully vaccinated. He, he got a mild upper respiratory tract infection, had sin- mild sinusitis. And he said, quote, this would have been much worse if I hadn't been vaccinated. Right. That's right. And I, I think that once we use the term breakthrough, we set a bar for this vaccine that is not going to be easily met. And if we're going to give this booster, which is what Everybody is pushing for it. Everybody puts for it. It bothers me, actually, that our vaccine advisory committee didn't get to vote, vote on that with this most recent, you know, vaccines for. I mean, I think when President Biden stood up and said um, on August 18th, we want to offer a vaccine for everybody over 60, a booster vaccine, a third dose of mRNA vaccine for everybody over 16 years of age, that was rejected by the FDA vaccine advisory committee and the ACIP twice. Nonetheless, that's where we are. And I think... Um, We've we've created an unrealistic expectation. And if, if we're going to do that, then just explain to the American public that we're boosting or neutralizing antibodies now, that over time those will come down and this may not be the last dose. Yeah, I agree that uh, that's in six to eight months, we're going to need another booster if really that's what your tra- strategy has changed to, right? And what do you do for mandates? I mean, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia mandates the vaccine for its employees, which are Tens of thousands. Um, the West Orange and, and it's two dose mandate. We we are sticking to the two dose mandate, but there are institutes. The West Orange Institute across the street, as yeah. far as I understand, has a three dose mandate. So what is it? What does it mean to be fully vaccinated? Columbia yesterday just instituted a three dose mandate. I I sort of knew this was going to happen, and um, so that yeah, I'm, I'm afraid fully vaccinated. Sounds like it's going to be three doses. Now, Paul, you mentioned- For now, until it's four doses. Until it's four or five. (laughs) I I also feel like in some of the arguments, people may not explicitly be saying this, but some people are almost arguing that it's not about protecting the individual from infection or protecting the individual from disease, but it's some sort of population um, issue of- let's actually try to stop transmission in our community. And if we have this group of people who won't get vaccinated, then let's make everybody else even less susceptible. Um, But no one's actually saying that and trying to make that argument. No, uh, I've heard it a little bit, Brianne. So I think, so that's the question. If, If you've gotten two doses of vaccine and now you get a third dose and therefore you're less likely to be infected and therefore less likely to transmit the virus because you've now had a third dose. Um, will that have an impact on the population? Will it? Uh, because, you know, certainly if you've gotten two doses, in theory, you should be shedding less virus for a shorter period of time than if you hadn't been vaccinated and have a mild illness. I mean, to me, and maybe it's just because, you know, I work in a hospital, it's like, I just feel like the booster story has largely been a detour from what we really need to do, which was is to vaccinate the unvaccinated. I mean, because that's really where the transmission is the most, I think. And that's where we're seeing most of the disease and, mm-hmm. and certainly most of the hospitalization. Well, it seems to me that if everyone in the U.S. or nearly everyone were vaccinated, we wouldn't be having this discussion at all. You're, when we, when yeah. we, you give first of all, you give credit to the Trump administration for for Operation Warp Speed and making a vaccine that was safe and effective much more quickly than I think any of us thought was ever be possible, especially yeah. with the novel technology. And 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 credit to the Biden administration for figuring out how to mass produce, mass distribute, mass administer a a vaccine in a in a public health system that really wasn't geared toward mass right. vaccinating. I mean, this is the biggest mass vaccination program in the world's history. We already have like three and a half billion people who are fully vaccinated, nine billion doses that are out there. And and, and so, you know, if we had stayed where we were because we got to like one, one, uh, you know, one uh, like like one million people a day, two million people a day, three million people a day, four million people a day is like around April. And then we hit a wall and and you knew that was going to happen. You knew we were going to get to the people. These are the people who want it. And then they're the people who don't want it. Then what to do? Paul, you, you mentioned a few minutes ago that, uh, and, and I think this, the way the booster's been sold has changed, right? You said originally Fauci, Dr. Fauci said he didn't think this 90 percentile protection against severe disease would hold up for Delta, right? 
it did. <laughs> and now he's saying it won't hold up for Omicron. In both cases, there's there's no data. There's just this, this feeling that uh, it might happen. But more recently, it's that we put the first two doses too close, and now we need a third to fix that. Do you— do you uh, think? Do you have any opinion about that? Right. So that's that's sort of the, um, the the dogma at some level, which is that if you really want to have decent frequencies of memory c- c- cells, B and T cells, that you need to have that four to six month interval. Because look at you know the inactivated polio vaccine or purified protein vaccines, where that seems to be true. Is that also true here? Well, it might be, but you don't know that yet. We don't really have any experience with mRNA technology with other vaccines. So is it really acting like, say, an inactivated viral vaccine? Because it is different, right? You, you hear in this case, viral proteins are made in the cell. I mean, it, which is a little closer, you could argue, to live attenuated viral vaccines and may act like more like live attenuated viral vaccines. I mean, all, all I would ask is that, and I hope the CDC does this because I think it's incumbent upon them to do it. You know, Rochelle Walensky, the director of the CDC the other day, said, OK, we the first 40 cases of Omicron have been identified. Um, Ten of them are in people who were unvaccinated. Thirty are in people who've received two or three doses of the vaccine. Great. OK, that 40 is going to become... 400 is going to become 4,000, is going to become 40,000 soon enough. I mean, this virus appears to have a doubling time of, according to the CDC, in the U.S., two days, according to South Africa, three days. Um, So we should have those data. You should have those data and present those data to us and give us a compelling reason for why a third dose makes a difference in terms of preventing serious illness. I think the one, I don't know if you saw this graph. I actually have it here. Let me... um, the, there was a graph that was, I just saw it yesterday that was put online where it's looking at um, in the um, Gao Tang province in South America. You saw this this graph. I mean, so so you see that the um, I think it's a small province in South America, but you see. Oh some, no, it's actually a very large province. That's where both Johan- province, yeah. that's where both Johannesburg and Pretoria are, um, and so it is the very it's very large. populated. It's not the largest, yeah. but it is one of the most populated and uh, one where you see quite a few people. <laughs> Okay, cool. So, so, but when you see, and so you know this, this graph is you see the the sort of the beta variant come in, where and so you see the spike in cases and a concomitant spice, spike in hospitalizations and deaths, and then that sort of settles down. And then you see the delta variant sweep through in the in the you know June, July, August uh, months, and then you big spike, even bigger spike, and then big spike in hospitalization, big spikes in deaths, and then comes down again. Then you see like November, December, you see a, a big spike with Omicron in cases, but you'd see a much much smaller spike in hospitalizations and a negligible spike in deaths. So, so what does that mean? I mean, it means either one of two things or both of two things. Either one, that, that, that because now the population is more immune, either from natural infection or immunization or both, that, you know, there's a blunting of that uh, serious illness. Or that, that this is a less virulent virus. I mean, that's the other possibility. Or both those things are true. But um, I, I, th- I wish we'd stop looking at cases uh, because, you know, there's going to be cases because natural infection and immunization isn't very good at preventing asymptomatic or mildly yes, symptomatic yes. infection. What you really are expecting to see is a dissociation between cases and serious illness. Yes. Either from yes. because you've been naturally infected or immunized or both. And that's really this story. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. And, and- you know, the recent outbreaks in universities, which have thrown campuses into disarray because it's it's going to be break soon and they want to get these kids out of there before they're quarantined. It seems to me it's because they're testing. They just pick up infections, but they're all asymptomatic or most, right? Uh, I, I, Right, my my uh, my daughter is in Ithaca right now with her her fiance, and <laughs> he's getting his MBA, and so they're like on lockdown yeah. because of an outbreak. And so I said to her, any serious cases, anybody being hospitalized? No, it's all sort of mild illness. And so imagine if we did this for flu. Yeah, imagine if exactly. we had PCRs on everybody to see whether they had flu, even if they'd been vaccinated. Now you'd find a lot of positivity out there. Yes, I mean that's the key. That because it's a pandemic, we're doing unusual things, but in fact. We don't do this for other viruses. And if we did, uh, we wouldn't like the outcome, as you say. I think that's a great yeah. point. It, it'd be fascinating from an immunological point of view to have some of those data. However, um, we would not want to do the sort of policy changes that those data might indicate to us. <laughs> exactly. Now, it seems to me we have, as you said, we have vaccines that prevent severe illness. And why are we now testing people randomly? We, you should just let people get sick and then you could test them to see what's going on right 
And you could argue they benefit. I mean, my, my niece called me the other day. If she'd gotten two doses of Pfizer vaccine, then she got COVID, went to a party, got COVID, had basically two days of a fairly trivial cold. I mean, in many ways, she's better off, right? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I think with influenza, you, you get probably some mild infections during the season, and it boosts your immunity, right? Right. And um, But we never know about it. And here, uh, every little... And then people get freaked out. Oh, we're reinfected three, four, five times. Did you get really sick? Did you go to the hospital? No, it doesn't matter, right? Well, I think at some point would, we have to get used to this, right? Known, would you have known that you were reinfected? Um, if I asked you if you were reinfected, would you have said yes if you hadn't had that test? Right. <laughs> exactly right. Oh, uh, I mean, think about it. We were trying to prevent mildly symptomatic infections. It's just such a painfully high bar. And to watch us go through this, and, and I think the most upsetting thing for me is I just don't think we've communicated what we're trying to do here. And we scared the hell out of people. I mean, you watch some pundits on CNN go on there. I think the term was viral blizzard. We were about to undergo a viral yes, blizzard. Yes. And, um, you know, I just, I think in some ways we may find what South Africa found, which is that hospitalizations and deaths are, are not as uh, a, as big of a consequence as it was for Delta. Uh, it, and, and that should be the focus. That should be what we're paying attention to. But I just think we, we're just so good at scaring people and we're scaring the wrong people. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm <laughs> Third dose. I'll get ten doses. I'm in. You know, but it's just like it's the people who are vaccinated. Those are the ones you want to get vaccinated. I agree with you 100 percent on, on everything you've said, and and I think that the pundits are scaring people, and we know who they are. They're the same people they talk to all the time. For some reason, you know, you don't scare people, and you, they still have you back, which is really good because <laughs> they want people that scare people and generate eyeballs looking at their news programs, right? So, Paul, there, there seems to be another 100 million United States citizens, though, that still need this vaccine. That's a very large number to reach. So how I mean, you they've know? heard this again and again and again and again. They know the score, and yet they're willing to take this ridiculous chance. What's up with that? I know you haven't got a degree in psychiatry, so I'm not asking you that, or, or aberrant polit political views. But, I mean, what do you tell those people? Well, so, so I think you can divide them into two groups. The, the, I think there are the skeptics. They, 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 they're concerned. They, they, it's hard. I'm sympathetic to the notion that you we're asking people to inoculate them with a biological agent that they don't understand to, with, you know, to prevent a disease that, that is scary to them. I, and, and so it's understandable that, they, that people are nervous. I, I get that. And I, I think some people are reassurable, the skeptic. Just, just show me the data. Tell me, make me feel better. Because I have been able, I get a lot of emails and calls from people, and when I'm on service, I try and convince people. So there are people who are convincible. But then there's the cynic. I mean, the group that, that the just... The cynics, they, yes, 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 yes. I mean, they're telling you they, they don't trust you, they don't trust the government, they don't trust the pharmaceutical right. agencies, they don't trust the medical establishment. I, and, you know, I think the, the Neil deGrasse Tyson line, which I mean, you all know, is that if someone doesn't use reason or logic to reach a conclusion, reason or logic isn't going to talk them out of it. And I think that's... Oh, no, that's right. That's right. Uh, what do you do? You mandate. I, I think, and to some extent, that works. Philadelphia, for example, just mandated um, a vaccine for any institution that or organization or bar or restaurant that sells food or, or drinks, which includes the Wells Fargo Center. So wow. you go to a Flyers game, you go to a Sixers game, and there's no reason to go to a Flyers game, by the way. They're just... <laughs> <laughs> you go to those games, I mean, you'll, you'll, you have to show your proof of vaccination. That, that's good. I mean, that may... Yeah, here in New York, you have to do that. Uh, you have to show proof wherever you go, restaurant, bar theater and everyone does it it works right but and, and you know there's a black market for fake uh, IVs for, you know it's it's a crazy world isn't it of course some, I, some nfl players have been found <laughs> i know well i mean you I just know. show them you just show them a, a photo of your vaccine card which is easily falsified right. obviously brianne you were gonna so, say something I, I was just gonna say that whenever i'm trying to convince people um, of some of the points that exactly the same things you're saying here. I often fall back on the idea that, um, you know, they're, they're making this choice of being vaccinated versus nothing. Um, and it's not really a choice. That's not really the choice. The choice is you're going to be vaccinated or you're going to be infected without having been vaccinated, that you're going to be infected right. either way. Um, and do you, do you agree with that? Do you think that that is a reasonable that's reasonable logic. That do we think everyone's going to be infected with this? Yeah, well, John Udell was the first one to say that, right? So the head of virus research at NIH and somebody I trained with at Wistar many years ago. But he, 
Um, but he's been on Twitter many times. But he, he said very early on, uh, you're going to have two choices over the next few years, be vaccinated or be naturally infected. And vaccination is always a better choice. Also, when people say, look, this is my decision, it's my body, that, that's not true. This is a contagious virus. I mean, you're making decisions with whom you come in contact. And, and, you know, the worst thing that when people ask me, what's the worst thing that anti-vaccine activists say? I think what that is, is when they say, what do you care what I do? You're vaccinated, which makes two incorrect assumptions. One, yeah, yeah. 100% effective, true of no vaccine. And two, right. that everybody can be vaccinated. I mean, 3% of people right. in this country are not going to be successfully vaccinated because of their immune suppression. And you read all the time about these remorseful comments of people who were doubters, who ended up in the hospital, who their last words were, I would have done this much differently if I had, and then you can fill in that blank any way you want. But that, it's a shame that it comes down to you know, like foxhole Christians, so to speak, uh, just before the bomb hits, you turn into a devout Catholic. <laughs> well, I can say that I went to Notre Dame. So I, <laughs> and the, the point that you're making, actually, uh, there's a third assumption there, which is that you actually don't have these people's best interests at heart, that you don't care if they right. get sick when they're saying, why, oh. why do you care if I'm not vaccinated? Well, because I right. want you That's to right. be healthy. Mm. Yes. Yeah. yes. But also, Paul, as you know, they overburden the healthcare system. Oh my gosh! I mean, I've seen, I've read stories of hospitals, not necessarily in big cities, but in small places where everyone's stressed out, people can't yeah, work, yeah, yeah. and there are that's no right. beds available. And that's not really fair, is it? No, I, I, I mean the hospital, our hospital, Children's Hospital, uh, Philadelphia. Is a, I love being there. I've been there for many decades, but. Morale's a little low. I mean, it's just it's it's hard to constantly, you know, you you put on the you know you make sure you have an N95 mask that fits well. You're you're wearing goggles when you walk in. You know you have you know just you have all this stuff on your face, and you're you know you're trying to interact with this family. And there's this wall between you and this family. You're watching this child suffer, struggle to breathe, right. coughing, coughing, cough. It's really demoralizing day after day after day. It's it's hard. Yeah, and and they, you know, I think they need to think about that and be made more. There was a wonderful uh, op-ed in the Times last week by a physician in uh, rural uh, Michigan, I think, who said this is, uh, this is thoughtless of you to do this and inflict this on people. And, and in fact, there are other illnesses that we have to take care of and we can't as a consequence. Do you okay. think, Paul, we are at the, li the limit of people who are going to be immunized in the U.S. and it's not going to get much higher? Um, I, I fear so. I, I certainly don't think there's any more information out there that could be scarier that would make people think, OK, now I think I should get a vaccine. I mean, right. you know, 800,000 people have died already. I, I, I can't imagine there is anybody in this country who doesn't have a friend or family member who hasn't at some level suffered from this virus at some level. Um, and maybe the thinking is, well, it was mild and it got better and everybody's fine. And I don't believe that 800,000 number. But no, I, I, I don't. I, I, maybe. And, and there was you probably saw this. Uh, it was a JAMA paper where they looked at, um, at they did serological studies on like 1.5 million blood banked units and found that the the uh, the population immunity was roughly 80 percent, either from natural infection or vaccination or both. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, where do you have to get to, to to really significantly to have some evidence for clear herd immunity? Obviously, I, I, we're not there. And Israel might be getting there because they're, they're roughly 90 percent. Isn't it 89, 90 yeah, percent? Yeah. Well, you know, Vermont is pretty high and they've still got big problems in rural Vermont, not in the centers of the cities. But so I, I wanted to ask another question now that has more generic uh, implications, and that is, you know, I, taught, I taught at a school of public health for 38 years. <clears throat> and public health is the public's health, okay? There's no other stupid way to say it except that's what it is. It's for the public's health. Now, how could you be against that? And the answer is it's not an individual thing. It's the public, the public's health. That word has a numerical value to it, 338 million people. And how could you not want to be held accountable for violating a public health regulation that would endanger the lives of hundreds of millions of people, like, for instance, meat inspection or food inspection in general. Uh, every time there's a, an outbreak of a, a food item, everybody panics. Of course, then they, then they buy the food item and the price goes down in half, <laughs> which that never made sense to me either. But <laughs> I remember what happened in the mad cow disease epidemics. But, but these people are... <clears throat> They're using the wrong excuse to be against something. 
my body is my own. Mean to tell me you would just disband all of public health because your body is your own and that's the deal? Everybody fends for themselves. It's an autocracy of 338 million people. That's absurd. That, that, that argument doesn't hold any water whatsoever. And right. yet, and yet, and yet. There's no good reason not to get a vaccine. How do you hold them? How do you hold somebody accountable for breaking a general public health law? I mean, you can see what happens to companies that skip a step in terms of sterilization, that get some foodborne illness out into the public. They get massively fined. They get bad reputations. They get horrible press. Sometimes they have to close. I mean, why why doesn't that apply to this one? It's logic, and, and as Neil deGrasse Tyson said, you can't use logic. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. But you can't I use it. Uh, every um, time I... Um, Every time I encounter this argument, I get the same horrible gut level feeling. <laughs> yeah. So basically, go ahead, Brian. Go um, ahead. So I feel like a lot of the things we've been mentioning, including uh, sort of Dixon's comments, are still getting at this individual versus population yeah. um, issue. Um, and I think that um, what we've said about boosters in particular is kind of maybe it doesn't make sense for them to be mandated for the entire population. Um, but I guess, what are your thoughts about boosters and individuals? Is there a downside to getting a booster for an individual? Um, or should individuals be getting boosters? Or is there a reason to not get that booster? Because you've also said there's no reason to not get a vaccine. You know, so here's what <laughs> I think that it's if you're over 65 years of age, I think it's reasonable to get a third dose of mRNA-containing vaccine. Um, the J and J vaccine was always a two dose vaccine. I think you should get a second dose of J and J vaccine. I think right. if you're if you're over fifty, and you have a high risk medical condition, I think especially obesity. I mean that seems to be the single most important factor um, associated with that, that. That it's reasonable to get a third dose. What worried me and, and what worried my fellow voters on the FDA's vaccine advisory committee was the young healthy person. So, so now when you're talking about a 16 or 17 year old, where you know that at least the Israeli data and the U.S. State data for myocarditis for, for U.S., it was about one in 5,000 for Israel, it's about one in 7,500. That's not trivial. I mean, and, you know, right. I'm sure that over time, although it appears to be a short lived, self-resolving transient phenomenon, there, there will be a spectrum of illness associated with this. And you, you would. And so there has to be a compelling reason to do it. And if the compelling reason, which is right now to make sure that you don't have a mild infection or a low moderate infection for a certain period of time. That's just not a great reason and, and to me. And yeah, so I guess yeah. that, that's where I have, and then to, to sort of mandate it, you know, for, you know, for, for a young person, say to walk into the New York Philharmonic, somebody told me that they, they're now sort of making that a three dose thing, but. Uh, do you think that, do you think that a third dose will um, come up for kids? Well, you know now for the, that sort of six month to five, the less than five year old, they're not right. doing the three dose series, but that's more a primary series because the two doses didn't work. Um, right, right, right. But in the say five to eleven. Um, I don't know. I, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to be open minded to the fact that protection against severe illness doesn't hold up with Omicron, but 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 I really want the CDC to show that they yeah, should exactly. show that because exactly. I wonder whether there's. I just hope there's no disincentive to showing that because they've already made the recommendation that they'd be willing to show data that opposes that recommendation. They yeah. should. Yeah, that's a great point. If it turns out that even people with two doses are fully protected against severe disease, then they should say that, right? I mean, yeah. as the, yeah. the, the studies are in, are ongoing, I'm hoping we'll see those data, and so they should be. If they want to maintain their credibility as a public health institution, they should, right? Yes. Um, so th let's say the the timing of the first two doses is what interrupted generation of memory, so the third dose fixes that. Why don't we then go to a dose, and then six months later, a second dose? Couldn't we? Do we have to do a trial for that? Um, I think it's a great point. I mean, I, th I think it, at least from the data that I've seen you guys present and read also, you know, there does seem to be a, a that, that interval, that longer interval does seem to provide, um, you know, a higher titers neutralizing antibodies, arguably broader neutralizing antibodies. And so that, and I'm sure that's a value. So sure. I think that when that we first, when this all first launched, you just wanted to get as good of immunity as quickly as you could. Now there's a little more time. The yeah, only thing yeah. that, that I would argue is that, if you get just one dose and you're waiting now six months, yeah, 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 sure. You know what's going to be the protection during that six months? Sure, 
to tell exactly, exactly. No, no, that's well, a perfectly that's good point that your risk is there at, between those doses. Yeah, it's a, it's a balance. I, I totally agree. And it may, it may argue for two closely spaced doses, which we know are good, and then a third later on. But I, I'd love to see the data. So, and, I mean, and in particular, kids who are just getting vaccinated, it seems a shame to give them, <laughs> you know, three, four weeks space and then another one, whereas they could get it all at once. But I suppose we don't have the data. Yeah. No. It's an interesting. And it does raise another point about another disease, of course, and that's flu. Um, we sort of skipped a, a season for flu because everybody stayed indoors during the 2020 uh, event, but no one's doing that anymore. So there must be more flu coming up as we speak. Um, there doesn't seem to be a reaction against the flu vaccine like there is against this one. Any uh, thoughts about that? Um, well, you're certainly right. I mean, the, the most common reason now for children to come into our hospital is influenza. Second is respiratory right. virus. Third is human metanumavirus. COVID is actually fourth among the respiratory viruses. So, yeah. Interesting. Um, the, the, uh, what was interesting last year, typically 75 to 150 children will die every year from flu. Last year was one. One child. Wow. I mean, you know, on the FDA vaccine advisory committee, you have to pick flu strains every year, and you yes. pick based on what's circulating from the, in the previous interval before they they pick. There really wasn't much flu because what did we do? I mean, that, <laughs> exactly yeah. right. Exactly. We right. Schools, we closed businesses, we restricted travel, we completely shut uh, down the economy, which is a big price to pay, by the way, to stop respiratory virus. And it was all of them. It wasn't just flu. It was RSV. Yeah. It was yeah. We didn't see any. We did. We we are usually loaded with RSV induced bronchiolitis over the winter. We saw none last winter. It was How about remarkable. That? It was like a miracle. But it's bad. Yes. 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 Do the, I I think we this came up before, but I want to bring it up again. Do the flu vaccines prevent uh, mild flu? They don't, right? No, not not. No. They yeah, prevent hospitalization. Yeah, no, you're right. The reason you get a flu vaccine every year is that um, even if you've been vaccinated or naturally infected the year before, you still are at, at, at a reasonable risk of having serious illness. So that's why you get that, that flu vaccine the next year. See, when people talk about a yearly COVID-19 vaccine, they're thinking of the flu vaccine, but that, that is really not the reason mm -hmm. we would be doing it. I just think we need to explain that. Better. So for flu, we do yeah. it because of antigenic variation, correct? That's right. Right. Flu, flu mutates or... Yeah. Uh, to a much greater extent, obviously. Than well, the other thing is that when you look at annual mortality rates from flu, I mean, it varies from 20 to 40,000 people, and they're mostly older people. And, you know, the, I, I don't want to dismiss older people because I happen to be one of those. But <laughs> most, most statistics will say, well, they were over 80 years old. What do you expect, you know? And so you, you, you sort of, you don't write them off, but you don't include them in either. Um, and I, I hate being in that group now. I really do. I wish I could change that, but I can't. Um, but no one gets upset by that number. Nobody gets upset but 20 to 40,000 people every year. Grandma and grandpa, they're no longer here because they just died from influenza. But you've got 800,000 people, and 70% of those people were over the age of 65. That's the same age group. And how many people is that? 70% of 800,000, that's 570,000 people, for God's sakes. That's just, what's wrong with that? I mean, well, again, venting from a personal perspective. I'm sorry that we're wasting your time, Paul. But <laughs> who else could we vent to but the converted? <laughs> So, Paul, there's one there's one aspect of Omicron that bears mentioning, and that is uh, that many of the monoclonals are not going to be effective, right? Yeah. If you believe in you know neutralization assays, although I have to say, um, and and Brianne and I talk about this a lot, there are non neutralizing antibodies that can be important <laughs> in protection against disease. So, um. Those, all those FC dependent functions. Yeah, and I just would very much like to. Uh, I, we did a paper on respiratory syncytial virus, Paul, where in at least the non human primates, uh, protection mediated uh, by vaccines is often not neutralizing antibodies, it's other kinds of antibodies. Right. I heard that, that twiv. Um, so I just think we're getting a little bit myopic on the neutralizing antibody. Anyway, so there, th that's obviously the monoclonal is, is, a, is a problem. And I, don't, I guess they'll have to make new ones, right? Because there are cer certain people who can't be vaccinated or don't respond, and they need monoclonals. Yeah, and, and if given early, a monoclonal antibody is clearly of value. The trick yeah. is making sure you give them early. So no one's asked about the Pfizer pill, so I guess I should do that. 
Here's a safety net for people arriving at the hospital ill. They're only been infected four days. Um, pop a pill in their mouth and they're supposed to get better. Is that true? I, I do think if given, you know, as you, I mean, you know this infinitely better than me, but I mean, viral replication is an important part of the disease process early on. But as time goes on, it becomes less important and therefore monoclonal right. or antivirals right. will have less of an effect. Where I do think this will make a difference is, is people are seem to be far more willing to treat themselves for an infection than prevent it. <sighs> Right. At least some people. So I think those people who, who people who are willing to take hydroxychloroquine or sue to make sure <laughs> they get ivermectin. I mean, that's often a group that doesn't get vaccinated. So I think there yeah. it may make a difference. That may be a value. Yes. Uh, yes. But I I suspect yes. Paul that we're going to see rapid resistance. So yeah, yeah you're right. Because so and many also I think that when you give a lot of the, when you really get a lot of you get hundreds of thousands of people, you're going to start to see side effects that haven't been defined yet. That's right. Uh, exactly right. right. All right. Anything else, guys? Brianne Dixon? Boy, I no, I mean, I could listen to Paul talk all day, but. I, mean, I could too, actually. I'd, I even like the way he laughs. So, I, you know, <laughs> you can get a snigger out of Paul and then and you've, your whole day is made because you've got such a bright. And uh, I think that if, when did you know you wanted to be a pediatrician, by the way? I, I think um, I, um, it, it was, I think it came from my childhood. I mean, I, I think the scars of our childhood invariably determine the passions of our childhood. I mean, I was, I was in a polio ward for six weeks when I was five years old. I ruptured oh, really? my spleen at the same year, you know. Oh, so my goodness. Uh, and so there were just sort of a lot. Of, and, and so I, I, I didn't have polio. I, I had a poorly performed operation on what was a club foot. Um, oh, dear. So, so it, was, it was botched. So I was in the house, but I remember polio. I, mean, I, I remember what it looks like. I remember iron lungs. I, mean, I just remember, I remember that right. window next to my bed where I would look out at the front door uh, of Kernan Children's. Uh, then it was called Kernan's Hospital for Crippled Children, when you could use words like crippled and feeble-minded in the names of children's hospitals. Lord. I remember looking, you only have one visiting hour a week. And I and I remember looking really? out that window, waiting for my parents to come save me. And oh my, my mother was ill with a complication with my brother's pregnancy, with pregnancy with my brother. And uh, my father was a sort of traveling salesman, so didn't really get to come. And so I was just there alone. And I think oh. that really, I think that drove me. I, I saw those children as vulnerable and helpless and alone, which is, I guess, in some way how I saw myself. So I guess we're always treating ourselves in some way. Yeah, excellent. Great. Wow, that's, that's absolutely amazing. And I, I will thank you in advance uh, for the fact that uh, many of my friends have small children. Um, and I know that I will be using this information uh, in conversations with them quite a bit over the next week or Absolutely. two. I like that. Absolutely. I like you're always treating yourself. That's great. I like that very much. Paul Offit, University of Pennsylvania. Really appreciate your time, Paul. It's great. We, you have a lot of fans out here. Thank you. So a much. lot of fans. You have a lot of fans, too, including my wife, who is your biggest fan. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Very Bring good. her on next time. Come on. <laughs> take care, Paul. All right, take care. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Wow. What a dynamic person he is. He's truly amazing. I love him. I always, I always liked Paul very much. Yeah, I think he uh, is, is a good thinker. I don't know any pediatrician. I've never met a pediatrician that did not have the ability to, to communicate with people of all ages. Because they've, they've obviously got to communicate with their patients, but they've also got to communicate with the parents. Mm -hmm. And they have the toughest job of all because usually the kids can't tell you what's wrong. Yeah. Well, a lot of can't, the adults can't either, but I, they're almost like veterinarians in that sense because their patients can't really talk to them and tell them where it hurts. <laughs> so, and you know, Peter Hotez is a very open, very gregarious type of person. He's got a broad sense of humor. He's... And those are the kind of people that I've always associated with this field. And uh, to find one with so much expertise in virology is really a breath of fresh air. Yeah, I think pediatrician, dealing with kids, treating kids um, requires a certain kind of person. Because as you know, not all physicians are like that. No, they're not. You know, no, many of not. them are quite different, reserved, even um, somewhat cold, uh, you know, and clinical. No, but, you're right. Uh, which you're is not to criticize right. them, but uh, it's different. And you can't do that with kids, right? Nope. Right. You, you can't do that with kids, but you also have to have a certain strength to deal with kids who are having difficulties um, and not, yeah, yeah. you know, really True. have trouble with that. But I have to say Very the true. best 
physicians are ones that like to talk about their stuff. And no matter what they you ask them, they answer. They're engaging. They're obviously into it. Those are the best. And there are others that are, are quiet. The there are others that are quiet and read it. And that's not good because you're worried, right? As a patient, you're always worried and you want to hear. So I, I can tell the difference right away. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what determines it. It's not just where you were trained. You know, it's something else on top of it. No, I think they're selected for by their patients. I really do. Maybe, think, maybe that's it. You know, they want to be around children because they have a, a certain childlike attitude among themselves as well. And I, I've never known one that's um, harsh and uh, difficult to talk with. But what really bothers me, and I know I'm going to raise the hackles of listeners. <laughs> yeah, what is it, Vince, at this time? <laughs> is that they use the test, the, the um, well, first to get into medical school, the, the MCAT, which they think is an indicator of those who will graduate from and pass the boards, right? Which is what they right. want to do. So it's all based on tests. It's not based on potential. Well, well, you know what? I would say figure out what does correlate besides a test because the test is ridiculous. This whole <laughs> industry built around MCATs with people no, coaching with and doing in. this no, for you. That's not to get out. That's, it's that's to, to get, get in. in. It's to get in. But they think that's a predictor. And I guess the data say it's a predictor of passing the boards. But yeah, but my our gosh. medical school never operated that way, Vincent. Even though they did look at the MCAT scores, they, I was on the admissions committee for 25 years and – and they would go by personality, uh, uniqueness of um, background, um, their ability to think on their feet. Because in a lot of interviews, you know, you ask them questions that they've really got to think about on, at that moment. And um, they've never heard that question before. And their answers are very telling as to what kind of people they are. I used to like so, uh, the applicants who could think on their hands, Dixon. Uh, well, okay, on their hands and sitting on their thumbs, if you wish. But <laughs> but I do, I agree that being creative is going to be more, but it's harder to do that, right? And so you, right. you well, fall back on, sta I hate standardized tests. I think they're, I always did well, well on them, but I still you. hate I them. I think they're horrible. And I think they eliminate a lot of people who could make big contributions to society. Well, That's guess true. what? The, the medical schools are now thinking about eliminating uh, part one and part two of the board's the because they don't, they don't think they predict who's going to become a good doctor. Who's so not the problem is that even if you eliminated the MCATs, horrors, then you're ready, then you what are you going to depend on? Nate grades, which are also difficult. Letters because, of recommendation. You know, some uh, people don't test yeah. well, but they're very smart. So I don't know what. To yeah, do. no, you're right. You're right. Yeah, I mean, I think that one key point here is that interview that Dixon mentioned becomes incredibly important. Very. Um, so you know, in a lot of important. ways, you know, the MCAT is a first pass. And then yeah. students who do well enough on that get that interview. And that's right. no matter what we do with the MCAT, um, and I can also give you lots of examples of uh, students I've worked with who I've thought have been just spectacular, who have not tested well. And I find that very frustrating. Yeah, um, I'm sure they do too. I, I'm, in the, I'm in the same boat that as Vincent, as a person who did well on standardized tests, but I'm not quite sure what they ever tested me for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I... Uh, T cells. Think, they tested you on T cells. <laughs> <laughs> I I do think that all of this comes together to show just how important those interviews and those letters of recommendation are yeah, in yeah, yeah. making sure we illuminate those other aspects. Yeah, but you you'd be surprised how easy it is to spot somebody who's not being genuine with you when you start to delve into things like what do you do for fun. That was my first question I used to ask. What do you do for fun? And I've had some bizarre answers like, you know, the thing I really enjoy most is to curl up with a good book about biochemistry. <laughs> and I just sat there and said, next, you know, I let them go on and then they talked about their research, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, that's not going to be a doctor. That's going to be a researcher, obviously. I mean, I know, so, you know, I know people who take the MCATs, they bomb. And they spend two years studying and coaching, right. and then they do better. What's the point yeah. of all that? They're not going to remember any of that. No, Just to won't. demonstrate no, that on a statistical basis, these people who do this better are going to do better on the boards. That's just ridiculous. It's such a it's waste a of resources. World, it's, it's very competitive. And 
you have to have some way criteria for admitting people into medical school. No, I agree. I'm not saying we should have none, but I'm saying could we be more creative and think of other things than a standardized yep, I test? I, I, I think it for reflects sure. poorly on our ingenuity as a species, frankly. Yeah, well, when you're mass screening, right? I think we need a blood test for ingenuity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's well, true. By the way, um, the problem is we we need to have the ingenuity to have the blood test for ingenuity, right. and we don't yet have a blood test to figure it out in the first no, place. No, we don't. <laughs> that's right. I mean, we have that's genome right. sequences, and we have no idea what they mean, <laughs> for the most part. Oh, no, that's also true. <laughs> yeah, we we can tell if you have certain diseases, but we have no idea how you're going to do. <laughs> oh, it's so so interesting. Okay, let's do some email, and I think Dixon, you should take that first one. Yes, I, I believe I should. <laughs> um, okay, so Bob writes, Dear Twivers, much thanks for the great efforts made in TWIV 835 to disentangle breaking antibody findings. I must admit that a great deal was um, made. Uh, I, I'll read this again. I must admit that a great deal was, I think, so what is to say made rather than miles outside was, was miles outside of my current competencies. Nonetheless, I did want to note a flaw in logic expressed by Dr. Depommier with regards to parents being unwilling to vaccinate their children. It would not be a good science, in quotes, to ask how many of the parents had unquestionably accepted vaccines when they were young, because though I hope it being insignificantly small, the surveyed population parents could not fairly include those who did not survive to adulthood with sexual organs that were harmed in any way due to adverse effects from our historical vaccines. Hmm. Um, re parent skepticism, and then Kathy Spindler puts in a note. You want me to read that also? Uh, the surveyed population's parents uh, also couldn't include those who didn't survive because they weren't vaccinated. <laughs> Okay, so that's, you know, you get both sides of that one right away. Um, Re-parent skepticism. I propose a bit of, of patience. I think Dr. Griffin's description of current strategies makes more sense. That is, to let parents have the conversations with their primary care physicians. In our local health group, our region of North Toronto, uh, Simcoe, Muskoka, population approximately 600,000, and in as much as Canada, most of our teens ran to be vaccinated in early summer as soon as they were permitted to do so. As a result, since the return to school in our program in our region in September of 2021 and continuing until last week, we have had no outbreaks at all in our high schools. Meanwhile, we have had at least two dozen outbreaks in elementary schools, despite universal school safety measures mandated across the province. By way of showing what those protocols entail, like all students of any age, my four and six-year-old grandchildren usually need reminding when walking home with me or their parents that they can take their masks off. Sorry for the ramble, but just to suggest that I trust most local parents to be able to figure out our kids' vaccines once they have talked it through with their doctor. But statistically, it's not going to be a slam dunk. In our 600,000 population, we've had no COVID deaths at all in any person over the, uh, under, under the age of 30 for a total deaths in the region to date of 276. And our open access hospitalization stats suggest we have had very little, if any kids, hospitalized due to the virus. However, 225 of our current 665 unresolved cases are in persons younger than 20. And a large number of those are logically directed associated with primary school outbreaks, despite our best efforts for safe school education. This leaves me thinking the nuanced questions of a local parent, especially ones with any risk factors beyond being older than 30, for example, obesity, pulmonary disease, is, quote, do I feel my child's best chance for, survive, for thriving across a full lifespan is largely dependent on current parents say, staying well? If so, is the vac current vaccine for children effective such that my child is more likely to live a full childhood in the community without undue risk of disabling or killing their parents, unquote. Finally, I did run the numbers and published, as published by the CDC, the expected number of infections and in trials vaccinated children were approximately 13. The actual number detected was three. 
Using the unassuming Fisher X exact test with my SAS software, the probability of the three or fewer infections in the vaccinated kids, assuming the vaccine was no different than a placebo, was, and I para-metaphor phrase, a snowball's chance in hell. Actually, 6.678E-06. Bob. Well, that was quite an email. Thank you for asking me to read that. <laughs> well, I, I, because it dealt with your your discussion of parents and ch child vaccinations. Uh, however, I mean, I think I think parents should be able to do this to determine whether you know their children's lifespan is dependent on their parents. And so, I'm not sure everyone can, though. I'm just I'm not sure everyone can. No, I, I would agree, but. Um... I think people are, adults are willing to take what they would consider risks with their children, provided that if they don't, ah. they can't go to school. Interesting. I think that the vaccination decision is in the hands of public health officials. I think that's correct, oh, yeah. because I think uh, most parents, a lot of parents can't do it. They don't have the right, especially no. now, they don't have the right information. They have misinformation. If they had all well, the right exactly information, right. maybe, but they get, yeah. they get information that says vaccines are all bad and that's just not correct, right? Yeah, correct. My, biggest, my biggest thought with all of this is just how we're getting information to parents and what parents are actually hearing and how they're making these decisions and whether they're making them well. And I mostly think about conversations that I have with people and kind of what they're saying about information that they're getting yeah. and what their sources are. Um, and, you know, I'm always very flattered when people say, oh, well, you're my main source of information because I know you would never steer me wrong. You know, I've known you for this many years and you're the one who's, who I know is going to tell me the real story. Right. And that's wonderful and very flattering, but it's also somewhat worrying that they don't feel like they can get the right source of information from their doctor or the CDC website or something like that, that, they, that there's a question in their mind um, exactly. about some of those things. And so, you know, and there are many people in the world who don't know me um, or, you know, <laughs> or, or have a person who, for, to whom they can ask these questions. Um, and so I just look at this and say, I would love to figure out a way that, you know, we could make sure that these parents are getting the right information. It seems to me also that when programs are planned for parents of students, the PTA to be exact, that there is some politics involved in picking out the subjects. And I imagine that if one night they were to say, well, tonight we're going to hear all about the COVID-19 virus, my guess is that in many areas of the country, about half of the audience would get up and walk out. So if they don't want to listen even though what they're going to hear is factual and ap applicable to their own students, their own children. The, um, the I've made up my mind already and I'm going to tell you what I think attitude still persists. And that's, that's the biggest problem. Yeah. I think because if you can't appeal to them at a political level to say, Oh no, 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 no. I think, uh, you know, evangelicals have no right to say that God doesn't want us to be vaccinated because there's no vaccines was present during when the Bible was written. So how can you possibly say there's a religious reason for not getting vaccinated? Uh, it's it's a modern day thinking that causes those um, attitudes to spring up. So even when you take it to that level, I've heard rabbis go on radio and say, look, there's nothing in Judaism that says that you can't get vaccinated. There's, it's, it's not like a food regulation that you're going to eat pork and go to hell. The Jews don't have hell, by the way, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, if something bad <laughs> will happen to you. Um, that's not the case. I mean, they, and here's a religious leader saying it, and they still didn't go and get vaccinated. So, duh. I guess, you know, public health is in the eye of the beholder. And that's, that's a shame because one would think that by now uh, you wouldn't object, object to the fact that you didn't catch dysentery from drinking water out of the faucet. Although I have to say you might get lead poisoning. Um, there are some caveats to public health and there are some breaks in public health practice, which gives people pause with regards to the effectiveness of it. But in general, 
we have the, one of the healthiest populations in the world, and it's largely due to public health. That that's the case. And this is part of that. So why do we take so much pride in it when a third of the country doesn't even believe in it? I, I don't get it. Now, that's not a flaw in logic. That's just my own opinion, by the way. So what you just heard is the De Pommier rant recouched in a term that public health officials might also smile and say, yeah, you know, that guy's right. He, that, that's why does why do people mistrust public health? It's it's not really science that they're distrusting. It's someone telling them what to do when they don't want to do it. Well, it, it in some ways that also goes back to something that we were saying with with Paul, which is that at some point people don't have the idea that people have their best interest at heart. Yes, they yeah. suspect yeah. that there's a there's a collusion here with some subtext of political view that we're going to favor this group over that with, I don't get that. Well, there's also, a, they think companies make a lot of money and that's the driving reason for perhaps using, but, for using drugs and vaccines because they want to make a lot of money. Right. <laughs> but they do have a no, side they do, effect. They keep you healthy. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Exactly. I mean, right. polio vaccines have almost eliminated polio, right? That's yes. right. That's yeah. right. I, I want you to get a polio vaccine because I don't want you to be paralyzed. Yes. Right. The the more these things are used, the cheaper they get also. Notice this one's free. This is absolutely free. There's no yeah. reason in the world to object to it uh, from that standpoint. It's available to everybody. Let me, let me tell you, folks, I don't want anything to die, even a, a spider. I think animals are all interesting and uh, life is fascinating and they, they shouldn't be dying. So I don't want people to get sick. No. Um, so Brian's right when she says, I don't want you to get polio. I don't want you to get anything for sure. Nope. Um, JS writes, I'm listening to, in, to your small intro, to your intro small talk on clearing leaves, TWIV 830, and wanted to let you know that here in Washington, D.C., we have passed a law banning gas-powered leaf blowers, which finally takes effect January 1st. Maybe you can mention this kind of thing the next time you discuss leaves and provides a link. Similar bans are spreading across the whole country. In D.C., we address the issue from a noise perspective because we were not permitted to address the pollution emissions issue. This is not the case in California, however. Ah, the loveliness of different states, right? <laughs> we received support from uh, this organization, quietcommunities.org. <clears throat> it was great to hear Alan and the others use mulching to address the issue and Alan's horrification at the use of gas-powered blowers. And uh, JS sends a, vid a, comic, a comic video to share with others, especially Alan, which is very funny <laughs> about leaf blowing. I mean, it's just they seem to be just blowing stuff around all the time and not really picking it up or collecting it. It's funny. The other day I was teaching – I was at home teaching my virology class and some – people came to blow leaves out of my window wells and they were right next to me. <laughs> it's kind of like a – yeah, it's the consequence. Uh, Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Peter writes, all of the Twix hosts, I love what you do and how you do it. I was not reading any Omicron news until you had something to say about it. I understand that it takes time and this is early days. I didn't expect instant gratification. Ignore all the haters. I loved that it took 10 minutes to get to the pronunciation. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say so far, it being the early days. Um, and I am. Love yous all, as they say in New Zealand. Yeah, love yous all. <laughs> Dixon, you know what a you is? You ask me? Yeah, Dixon. Are you uh, Dixon? A, uh, female sheep. Can you take the next one? You bet. Anonymous writes, dear Twiv, I'm not a doctor, just a big fan of the show. I have a story and mystery for you that you must hear. I would appreciate it if you would keep my name and identity private. I held a wedding in Miami on Monday, 1122, for about 200 people. Many guests arrived in Miami on Friday, 1119, and spent the weekend in Miami on their own schedule. Many of my young friends went to maskless restaurants and clubs. Not a surprise for Miami. On Monday, 11.22, all 2,200 guests took home Binax tests and all tested negative before attending our wedding. 
I should note that myself and my wife also went for PCR tests on the day before, on Sunday, 1121, that were required for our honeymoon. We were both negative. The wedding was outdoors, however. Approximately 60 of those 200 guests, including myself and my wife, went to an after party at an indoor nightclub. So here are some results. The day after the wedding, 1123, I took both an antigen and a PCR test at the same time. The antigen test was negative. The PCAR test came back six hours later, positive. Over the next seven days, 40 of our 60 guests who went to the outdoor, the indoor after party have now tested positive with the exception of about 10 guests who previously had COVID and 10 guests, all of whom had boosters. I do believe some may still end up testing positive. Three vaccinated people tested positive for being at the outdoor part of the event. What is shocking to me is that it took it looks like we spread the disease at our after party the day after we all tested negative. Yes, it was a Binax test, but not a single one test came back positive before the wedding. However, it's clear multiple people were in fact positive and contagious. Even the PCR didn't pick up me. My friends are also reporting that for several days after they tested negative every day, but they went about their activities and now they have spread it to others. I have yet to hear of a mass testing situation that resulted in such a mess. Some people tested positive 24 hours after the event, meaning that they had to be contagious on the day they tested. Others clearly caught at the event. Uh, let's see. Others clearly caught it at the event because it took several days for their positive uh, results. I thought you should know about all this and would love your perspective. If Binax isn't catching us before we are contagious, is it a, worth, a worthless tool to use on events and gatherings? Uh, thank you, Anonymous. All right, so a lot of problems here, Anonymous, okay? First of all, you have no idea where everyone got infected. I would actually like to know who got symptomatic disease, first of all. Ah. I bet none of you did, and these are probably not even infections. They're probably, that's why the Binax now is negative because it was just a bit of RNA in your nasopharyngeal cavity, and that's why the PCR was positive. You actually had that happen to you once, right? I would like to know the CT value, but as Daniel said yes the other day, it's very <laughs> hard to get those numbers even now. Um, which, And by the way, he also thinks that testing all these university students is crazy because they're all asymptomatic, and then you quarantine people for 10 days for no reason? It's ridiculous. Anyway, so... You don't know where these, first of all, they didn't spread the disease. There's maybe spread the virus, but you don't even know that. There's no disease here. I would like to know the disease. I think that if the Binax now is negative, it means you're probably not having an, an, inf an ongoing infection. And the PCR can turn up positive from a little RNA present in you. So I don't think you can include anything. I think, if anything, they got exposed at this weekend where they're hanging around. You can't conclude that it was your after party that did it at all. The incubation period can be long. So... I don't think you should say Binax is worthless. In fact, Daniel thinks it's very worthwhile because it's probably not going to be positive until you have an ongoing infection. Yeah, I also find this story a little bit confusing um, because it says that they went to this after party at an indoor nightclub. Um, this makes the, that your story makes the assumption that the only people at the nightclub were you and your guests. And I can't imagine a situation yeah, in the nightclub true. where that is true. I would agree. Exactly. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I, this is not, I'm not doing this as a blame kind of thing, but there also are probably people who, even if it was just your party at the wedding, you, there were probably people who were um, working there. Did you test all of the people who were exactly working exactly. at the wet? Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I feel like you're leaving out a lot of people who are people um, who are part of this whole story. Um, right. And I agree completely with Vincent that um, I am not seeing any evidence of any disease here, nor is it really clear from the way you're discussing this that people that there's no way you can know that everyone was um, infected at this event. Um, maybe if you did some sequencing and made some file genetic trees, I, I, I might buy it. Then, <laughs> but, but, but otherwise, yeah. I don't see how you can tell that. 
Yeah. But you've got 200 people. You've got their mailing addresses, and you can follow up on this. Let's hear. Come on. Now I'm not sure it's worth it because let's do it right. if they're all well and they never got very sick, it's not yeah, worth exactly it. Right. Exactly and right. And this just illustrates why it's very hard to ascribe who transmitted to whom when, even with some data. But well, we don't have much here, but it's very difficult to do this. And you make assumptions about human behavior that I think are unjustified because humans do different things. So. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I also don't understand when the guests took the Binax test before the wedding and how how did you enforce that? And how did you, you know, did they have to come to the wedding with the negative? Like, no, probably not. I, and I'm sure some of them didn't confusing. do it. Yes, yes. right. <laughs> so it's a good illustration of how difficult it can be. Uh, Mary White, hello, Twift team. What exciting times. I suppose everyone in the world has sent you this article and beautiful simulation of the virus in an aerosol droplet, but... Here it is just in case. This was Brianne's pick some time ago, right? It seems to me the uh, it addresses the virus fitness question, but that's just the opinion of an accountant. I don't, I don't think it addressed any fitness question, frankly. It's just pictures of, a, of simulations of virus and droplets. Vincent, can, you can be justifiably proud of having attained 501c3 organization status for TWIV, but actually it's for Microbe TV. Regarding your conjecture about earlier contributions being deductible, the answer is in the determination letter you received from the IRS. In the upper right area of the letter is the effective date. That means from that date forward, contributions to the organization can be treated as tax deductible. The example letter was issued following application, but is retroactive to the date the sample organization was formed. So the date on my letter is April 11th, 2020. Cool. So all of 2021 donations are tax deductible, folks. And I looked at the date and I said, they must have made an error. But it turns out that's the day we formed Microbe TV Inc. on April 11th, 2020. So the 501c3 is now retroactive to that date, which is cool. The previous company, Microbe TV LLC, was formed many years ago, but it didn't have tax exempt. And we couldn't actually change it to a tax a 501c3. So we had to form a new company and apply for that. Okay? So all of 2021, folks, your contributions and up to April 11th, 2020. One other important information regarding this determination is contained in the application you submitted to IRS, which forms a part of the determination. Your accountant probably advised you that you must keep the letter in a safe place. Um, well, I don't have an accountant, but I figured I should <laughs> keep it in a safe place. <laughs> I should have an account. I should have many things. Should have a safety I, deposit box. <laughs> when I go to do it, there's always seems to be an obstacle. For example, uh, I need to make a checking account for the 501c3, right? And then put all contributions into that checking right. account. Right. So I went online because apparently you can open checking accounts online now. And I did it at my bank where I have other accounts, including the LLC account, Right. The first question, is this an S corporation or a C? <laughs> well, it's neither. It's a 501c3, and there's no way to – so I can't even apply online. So now I have to go to the oh, bank up the street here, which I can't do till Monday. And, you know, I have other things to do. I really don't want to go to the bank. So you see how it happens, folks, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Oh, boy. Anyway, thank you, Mary. I appreciate it. Um, one more, Brianne. <laughs> Damon writes, Hi. I can't tell you how much I have appreciated your podcast, especially the clinical updates. As a public school principal trying to plan best practices for my students and staff, as well as my family and myself. In the summer and early fall, I felt confident that the science wasn't there on the efficacy of boosters for otherwise healthy folks. My wife, a hospital nurse, and I decided to hold off while initial jabs were needed elsewhere. Now, despite no clear evidence of its necessity that I'm aware of, it's increasingly assumed that even able-bodied adults have been or will soon be boosted, and I can't decide the best course of action. Should we get the booster or wait until more data are available? In particular, I had wanted to hold out for more input on whether a Moderna vaxxed individual like myself should cross platforms and seek a J&J &J Janssen booster or stick with the Cadillac. Thoughts? My wife is approaching one year since her course, and I'm nine months out, but I'm older and, ahem, heavier. 
Thank you again for your efforts to provide comprehensible discussions of the evolving science to inform even the humanities folks out here in the fields. Damon. Uh, thanks for your letter, Damon. I would suggest that you should listen to the first part of this episode where we talked to Paul Offit. Um, and I would also say that given the information uh, recently about um, mRNA vaccines being preferred, um, I would probably, if getting that booster, would probably not seek out the J&J or Janssen booster. Um, I would get an mRNA, um, but you can hear what Paul Offit had to say about the booster information. Yeah, I mean, he basically said over 65, especially if you have a comorbidity, yep. you should get one, right? But he's still right. not, he's not really convinced that uh, the, the disease protection is going to be any lower against Omicron, right? Yeah, I, mm. I think I think that what I heard from him and the thing that I probably will, will tell people who ask me um, is that uh, if you are not in that over 65 age group, you have to make a cost benefit analysis. And so if there's some particular reason why you think there is a particular uh, risk for you, then maybe the booster makes sense. Um, but if you don't have a reason why you think there's a particular risk for you, then a booster is not needed because there is maybe that risk of my, a little bit of myocarditis. Of course, there's also the thing where many places are beginning to say you need a booster to be fully vaccinated, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So you may have to take that into account. Okay, let's do some picks of the week. Brienne, oh no, Dixon, you're always first, Dixon. Sorry. Uh, that's okay. Brienne can go ahead. If she likes. Over. <laughs> oh yeah, Brienne can go first. I'm sorry. Brienne, what do you have for us? I have something that I know is a repick, but it is uh, a pick that I really think is important at this time of year, <laughs> which is uh, some patterns for some virus snowflakes um, from the Center for Virus Research at the Medical Research Council in uh, the UK. Um, so this is uh, a link to a site where they have PDFs um, of different snowflakes you can make based on the shapes of different viruses. Um, I know I made them last year and had a great time with it. Um, and a lot of other people, I think, enjoyed making those virus snowflakes um, last winter around this time. And so I thought that any of our new listeners who, was not, who were not aware should know about these um, if they were looking for something to do uh, to make some cool snowflakes. Uh, one of our listeners, Jen, made them for Amy and sent them to her. Exactly. I, I think she actually sent me one too. I haven't opened it yet. I just arrived yes. today. And, uh, the trouble it, is that snowflakes have six <laughs> point <laughs> symmetry and viruses. Yeah, but they don't have six don't. point. Yeah, that's okay. You got to take some artistic license, Dixon. Yeah. You, you, you do, you, you do, you do, you do. No, no, you should no, take I, a look at these, Dixon. I mean, I'm you kind of, have to fold them, and there's a lot. There is no, no, definitely symmetry. They're beautiful. Oh, no, I didn't say the symmetry oh, yeah. wasn't there. Uh, yeah. Just, yeah. I know. Um, but yeah, I, know. So, I, I really like them. Amy it's showed okay. them. No, I love them. I do love them. Amy showed them on Twiv. Um, yeah, last, last week. Last week, last Friday, yeah. Um, and they came with lights. So maybe you got lights too, Brian. That you, I you, might have. But I have to warn you, they get sparkle all over the place. Uh, <laughs> Amy's, That's okay. Amy sat at my desk, and when I went in earlier this week, it was all sparkle. <laughs> That's okay. But it looks good. It's very nice. A lot of worries. Dixon, what do you have for us? Okay, I... You know, I usually pick something artistic or maybe in outer space or maybe some game or maybe some comedians. But this time I really, I stumbled on this. They just recently published their 2021 world in a year pictures, photojournalism, basically photojournalism. And I started to look through them thinking, you know, this is going to be this. And they are remarkable. That's all I can say. I don't want to spoil it any further. Just put them up and let the people thumb their way through these. And um, it's amazing all the different things that happened in that year. And many, many talented people out there with cameras in their hands capture the moment. And, um, and that's what this is, capturing the moment of some important event. Not always good, not always bad. The photographer is neutral in terms of how they feel about these things. They don't want to interact with nature to try to prevent one animal from killing another, for instance. So they photograph the event. Um, unfortunately, they do the same when people are interacting with each other for the same reason. So we've had some tragic moments last year, and a lot of them are depicted here. A lot of them involve children. It's very, uh, very difficult to look at some of them. 
but I think we have to look at them to realize that these are little little vignettes of much larger uh, events, and um, we should just pay more attention to what's going on, basically. And I think that's what these pictures uh, say. Boy, Dixon, humans. I know. I know. These are great. I I'm scrolling through and I'm just it's a lot. so impressed. They're, they're, they're many per month. Amazing. They're, they're many and the Times month, has yeah. a very high standard for photographs and um, they've certainly done a lot of selecting to amass this uh, collection. I wish they had a higher standard for science journalism. <laughs> that's, a, that's a dig, isn't it? Yeah, that's it not is. just a dig. <laughs> you may never be asked again to. <laughs> I never did anything for them. Uh, no, uh, very didn't you rarely. Make science, didn't you make Science Tuesday once? What Science Tuesday? Oh, the that's thing when they. Yeah, I thought I, you were I, featured in that. Well, I went years ago. ago as a postdoc. Yeah. Yeah, but it was very go. different. But I mean, I've had several letters published. Amy and I had an op-ed published. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think they make a lot of mistakes, just like everyone else. Like like Paul Offit said, you know, they, they they talk to the pundits. They never talk to anybody different. They have their same people they talk to, and they feed them the same stuff over and over again. And I just think uh, it doesn't do them any good. Um, but that's it's never going to change. So I get to express my opinion here. <laughs> about You've done it. a lot of that today. <laughs> and if you don't like it, that's fine. Um, and if you do like it, that's fine also. It works both ways. Um, my pick, boy, I didn't know this. I just learned w this week. Um so Michael Schmidt on TWIM yesterday talked about a paper where they looked for plastic degrading enzymes encoded in bacterial genomes ah. because we're not doing a great job recycling because there's very little market for recycled materials. And often they end up in landfills. They end up in the ocean. They make these big plastic masses and they get degraded by physical activity and then they get taken up by plants and fish. And this article is called, Our Life is Plasticized. So there are tiny particles of plastic uh, floating in the ocean, and they end up in fishes. Uh, they end up in your drinking water, in fruits, and in vegetables. So you're eating them every day. And for example, let me give you some numbers. These are about a hundredth, one one thousandth of a millimeter. It's a micron in diameter. And um, the, the, the ocean's full of them. Where are the numbers? Like 150,000 per gram in an apple. 150,000 really? of these particles per gram of apple. Is it on the apple or in it's the apple? It's in the fruit. It gets taken up through the roots in the oh, water. I see, I see. And I see. as the apple grows, it's incorporated. I see. Uh, and in this paper, they talk about, this is an article, they talk about studies that have done to quantify these um, uh, Are any we, microbes in our microbiome capable of degrading them? So that's the good question. Um, so Michael Schmidt said that this control. So what they did, <laughs> they took DNA samples from oceans and uh, soil all over the world, and they looked for enzymes with homology to known plastic degrading enzymes. And the control was the human gut microbiome. Really? which they use to subtract out. We don't out. have any. <laughs> the assumption is we don't have any, but Michael said it's not clear because we may be developing some because we're eating more and more of these uh, plastics. Sure. So an sure. apple has one of the highest microplastic counts, an average of 195,000 plastic particles per gram, broccoli and carrots more than 100,000 particles per gram. So folks, you are eating microplastic particles with your foods. And I can't imagine that that's good, right? I had no idea that this was happening. I bet neither of you did either, right? I did nope. not. Nope, didn't. And fish have it in them too. I'm sure most things do. So I think you ought to know about this, folks. <laughs> it's really scary. Our life is plasticized. It is. I mean, you know, we worry about nanoparticles that we make and you know, eat or inhale, but man, mm. these are these are in our foods. We need to do some studies in animals and see what they do. Okay, um, what do we got here? We have two listener picks, one from uh, Jerry. I want to submit a listener pick 
uh, or alert you to this video released December 5th from one of the folks who worked on the J&J vaccine. It's an MIT lecture with Dan Baruch, an academic whose lab spearheaded use of the ad 26 vector for vaccine, subsequently worked with J&J on the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. I have a sneaking suspicion you're already aware of him, as I can't imagine folks at the top tier of virology, vaccinology, wouldn't be aware of each other. Uh, I am aware of him, but I'm not at the top tier of anything. So thank you for the I, comment. <laughs> I previously worked with Dan Brook, uh, so I knew Dan Brook, and I know of this lecture series. Uh-huh. <laughs> However, the Dan was on TWIV 244, which was recorded at the Deaconess a long time ago. Uh, and Alan and I recorded it. Um, interestingly, their studies in T-cell depleted rhesus macaques last year validated that T-cells pick up the slack when antibodies have contracted. I think, I think uh, yes, we're aware of that. This, the lecture also covers some of the timeline for the J&J vaccine, such as when they started working on the two-shot version. Thanks and keep up the interesting work. Segment with the New York City virus hunters today gave me some hope for the future and made me wish I had the opportunity to take part in such a program when I was between high school and college. Jerry, um, I think, Brian, they need to modify the vector to get rid of that PF4 binding I, area. I agree completely. Um, I think that, uh, and I think that that has to happen given all of the yeah. ideas that people have about using ad vectors. Yeah, all the different, not just COVID, but other viruses too. Yeah, for sure. Other viruses, gene therapy, all of those things yep. Yep. Um, clearly has to happen. And Louise, a quick follow-up to this week's peak. Paul Offit also wrote Pandora's Lab, Seven Stories of Science Gone Wrong. It's a great overview of how science can go amiss and damage caused by putting ego and money ahead of common good. Ego, folks. <laughs> we want the intense work of the scientific community to benefit humanity. Sometimes things go amiss, leading to either catastrophe or to renewed focus and innovation. We can and should learn as much from mistakes as from serendipitous successes. To quote my dear friends, follow the data. Loyally, Louise. I like when they sign it, loyally, Louise. Isn't that great? Anyway, this I didn't know Paul wrote Pandora's Lab. Uh, uh, that's perfect for today, obviously, because <laughs> he was here, Louise. I have to check that out. Did you know that, uh, Dixon or Brianne? Nope. I, I, I uh, have seen that book, yes. Have you read it? I have read it. It's very interesting. Yeah? Uh-huh. Yeah. How science can go amiss. Yeah, people can let their uh, their egos uh, push them. They can let money push them. Uh, they're no different from other humans, folks. People, this is true. Scientists are people humans. People are not different from other humans. That is <laughs> yeah, Scientists. <laughs> well scientists. put, Vincent. No, no, no. Well scientists put. are no different from other humans. In, men, in many ways, they don't have any... Um, they have all of the foibles of other humans. They may have different qualities and curiosity and persistence and so forth, but the, the, the negatives are all there. True. For sure. For sure. All right. That is TWIV 844. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send us a question, a comment, a pic, TWIV at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. We are a 501c3, so your contributions are federal U.S. tax deductible. Dixon de Palmiers at trichinello.org, the living river.org. Thank you, Dixon. Welcome, Vincent. It was good. Even with a reduced staff, it was very good. <laughs> Paul is a, a joy to, to listen to. I, I, I like he's Paul a joy very to much. To. Yes. Yeah, he's, he's great. He's well spoken. Brian Barker is at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thank you, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. And, of course, for all of your support listeners as well. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.